1983 film Scarface has one person in it who was based on a real person. That is the person who was called in the film Alejandro Sosa. He's the one who supplies Al Pacino's character, Tony Montana, with cocaine. In the film, he lives in Cochabamba, Bolivia, and is portrayed as an elegant, educated landowner. I think that the key part of the film is a meeting which brings together a Bolivian industrialist in the sugar business, the commander of an army, the interior minister, and the Central Intelligence Agency, together with Sosa and Tony Montana. A recording is played in which an investigative journalist talks of the cocaine coming out of Bolivia, which is controlled by one man, an interesting person, who comes from a good family and is British educated. In the film, that is Alejandro Sosa, but the description could equally have applied to the real Roberto Suarez Gomez. Whereas the film is fictional, as is the meeting, there's a certain element of truth in what is being suggested, and indeed, as we shall now see, the dilemma facing US authorities was whether to fight drugs or communism, or maybe a bit of both, or maybe none at all. The family of Roberto Suarez Gomez had been in Bolivia for several generations. His great-grandfather, Nicolas Suarez Callao, had developed the rubber business there, but with the development of synthetic rubber, the family went into livestock. It was Roberto who realized that there was more money in cocaine. Roberto Suarez Gomez was born on the 8th of January 1932. In 1958, he married Aida Levy Martinez, and much of what we know about him comes from her book. She claims that he did not know what he did when they got married, and once she found out, she left him, although they stayed on good terms for many years. His business model was to gather many Bolivian producers of coca and cocaine into one organization, which he called the corporation. He took care of the business end. Business was so good that he had an annual turnover in, of hundreds of millions of dollars. As we see in Scarface, the cocaine was sold relatively cheaply in Bolivia, with the risk of transport being on the buyer. At the end of the 1970s, he developed contact with the Colombian Medellin cartel. He had a fleet of aircraft that could fly in and out of Bolivia at leisure. By the end of the 1970s, between half and two-thirds of the cocaine in the United States originated from him. He was then the world's largest supplier of coca paste, a mixture of coca leaves, kerosene, sulfuric and hydrochloric acids, and bicarbonate of soda that's refined in Colombia to pure cocaine. A kilogram of base could be sold then for up to $9,000, and a light plane could carry around 500 kilograms. Fearing that the civilian government of Bolivia might take action against cocaine producers, he helped fund the cocaine coup, which brought the military dictatorship of Luis Garcia Mesa to power in 1980, whilst the cousin of Suarez Gomez became the Minister of the Interior. Thus, he became the king of cocaine, with the backing of the Argentinian Secret Service and the Central Intelligence Agency, neither of which wanted to see a progressive type of government in La Paz. Following the cocaine coup, the military went through the pretense of cracking down on cocaine for the benefit of Washington, but only in one geographical area. The cousin of Suarez Gomez, Interior Minister Luis Arce Gomez warned larger operators in Santa Cruz on the 26th of February 1981 to move to Beni, where they would have government protection. It would seem, however, that even this disrupted supply of coca leaves to Suarez Gomez, so he offered General Garcia Mesa $50 million to end the Santa Cruz operation. On 19th of May 1981, the crackdown abruptly ended. In the early 1980s, he was charged by the United States Attorney's Office in Miami with conspiracy to import cocaine, and with his importation, these charges could have got him a 30-year prison sentence. Two of his associates, 
in jail in Miami told the United States Drug Enforcement Agency of undercover agents that Suarez Gomez controlled Bolivia's military rulers so effectively that the foreign ministry copied and passed to him all the agency's narcotics investigation reports in La Paz. Despite protection from the government, he took his personal protection very seriously and he set himself up with his own personal bodyguards, allegedly called the fiancés of death. They were recruited amongst neo-fascist elements in Europe and Rhodesia. One advisor on his payroll was Nazi war criminal Klaus Barbie, who then held Bolivian nationality. The fascists from Europe, however, do not seem to have been bothered by a link-up with Cuba. According to Ida Levy, Fidel and Raul Castro contacted Suarez Gomez and Pablo Escobar in January 1983 and invited them to Cuba. The Cuban general, Antonio de la Guardia, was in charge of establishing a link with the narcotics bosses. When they visited the island, the leaders of the regime spoke to them of the marked interest that Fidel and his entourage had in using drug trafficking as a weapon against Yankee imperialism and to support the Colombian guerrilla groups with the funds coming from such smuggling operations. So with the excuse of anti-imperialism, Fidel and his brother charged them a million dollars a day in exchange for covering them for cocaine trafficking, free access to their territorial waters and airspace, and the use of their ports and airports to refuel ships and planes. Apparently, Fidel said, Thank you for accepting the invitation. You will be the missile with which I will pierce the blockade and the unjust embargo that my country suffers. Now enter Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North, then of the U.S. National Security Council. During the Iran-Contra affair, he had the idea of pretending that the Sandinista government in Nicaragua was permitting their country to be a shipment point for cocaine. To this end, he arranged for the purchase of cocaine from Suarez Gomez, which was sent to that country. The Nicaraguan military shot down the first plane, but a second one did land there. North also knew that the Medellin cartel was funding cash to the Contras, once more funded by Bolivian cocaine. Here we can see how totally illogical US policy was. It was fighting the war on drugs, yet the likes of Suarez Gomez had protection not only from the CIA but also the DAA as they supported the anti-communist regime in Bolivia, whilst indirectly allowing the government of Cuba to profit from narcotics business at the same time as turning a blind eye to organized crime at home because of the anti-Castro assistance it gave. Let's see if you can work that one out. When his son was arrested, Suarez Gomez offered to pay the, the foreign debt of Bolivia in exchange for his freedom. The son was arrested in Switzerland and the offer was made in a letter to Ronald Reagan. The offer was to pay off over three billion dollars over a 36 month period. Ida Levy said that her husband said that whereas some countries had huge oil and gold reserves, Bolivia had coca and after the collapse in the value of tin in the mid 1980s, Bolivia's second biggest export Coca was the only renewable strategic resource left to the government to get the country out of underdevelopment and to satisfy the hunger of the people. Even though he had a vast fortune and a turnover of hundreds of millions of dollars per year, he could not have found the $3 billion to pay off Bolivia's debt. Suarez Gomez was popular at home. Like many involved in organized crime, he shared his wealth paying for churches, schools, medical facilities and other activities. To quote the New York Times in August 1982, to the residents of Santa Ana, he is Papito, the remote cattle town's most cherished figure, who buys food for the poor, which stores churches, strings colored lights in the market square at Christmas, passes out sewing machines to women and paves village streets. He spoke like a nationalist against what he termed Yankee imperialism, and this went down well. The term El Padrino, recalling another gangster film, was used to his face, or El Robin Hood del Beni, 
in a reference to where he was living. He was proud that someone playing him had been in the film Scarface and wished that he himself could have been an actor. One thing that distinguished Suarez Gomez from other narcotics bosses is a lack of violence in the business. Unlike Colombia, Italy or the US where gangs can often fight out amongst themselves, there were only around five deaths in Bolivia in the 1980s from gang infighting and none were purportedly raped to Suarez Gomez. However, many progressives from trade union leaders, opposition activists and those requesting civil rights could find themselves victims to the death squads which appear to have been financed by Suarez Gomez and run by General Garcia Meza and Colonel Arce Gomez. During their time in office, over 1,000 people were murdered by the regime. Whilst researching this, I found a number of clips from the mid-1980s where the Bolivian authorities were asked why Roberto Suarez Gomez was not arrested. The answer, of course, was clear. He was untouchable. He openly boasted that he could pay off anybody he wanted in Bolivia. We asked Colonel Zapata, he knows where Suarez is, why doesn't he go get him? That's a beautiful question. Since Suarez is as strong as the narcotics police, maybe you should ask the armed forces why they haven't arrested him. So we did ask the army, General Lucio Añez, Chief of Staff of the Bolivian Armed Forces. I also don't know why Suarez is still free. Constitutionally, the armed forces are not in charge of narcotics. He was treated respectfully by everyone, from government leaders, many of whom were on his payroll, to representatives of the banks in La Paz, who met their deep need for hard currency by buying dollars from him. This all ended on the 20th of July 1988. A civilian government in Bolivia had not only returned Klaus Barbie to France, but was also cracking down on drugs. One of his homes was raided. The police found more than one and a half tons of cocaine. Despite this, Suarez Gomez claimed he had nothing to do with the drugs business. He got a 15 year prison sentence. In prison, he had an apartment with television, refrigerator, as well as spare beds for when family and girlfriends came to visit. He was released after seven years due to ill health, having suffered two heart attacks in prison. On the day of his release, he made a speech to waiting reporters in which he stated how he believed that the Bolivian government ought to crack down on drugs, which was now a problem in that country. Not the traditional chewing of coca leaf, but the refining and manufacture of cocaine, which led to dependency. In his last years, he did not return to the narco business. He looked after his ranch and died on 20th of July 2000, with nearly all of his vast fortune gone and regrets about what drugs had done to his family. His son, Roberto, Roberto Suarez Levy, was killed in a shootout with the DEA shortly after Roberto Suarez Gomez was arrested. He also worked closely with his nephew, Jorge Suarez. Following the arrest of the uncle, the nephew became the most wanted fugitive in Bolivia. He was arrested in San Marino, California on 16th of December 1990. He received a life sentence, although was released in April 2018. He returned to Bolivia, where on landing in La Paz was arrested and later got a further 15-year sentence. In December 2018, he was given a 10-day pass for medical treatment at a clinic from which he escaped. His current whereabouts are unknown. I will finish with a quote from an observation of my own. Suarez Gomez told his wife, The gringos have a false morality. I give you just two examples. The cigarettes manufactured by the Philip Morris Tobacco Company and the arms manufactured by Smith & Wesson, which are sold without any control in the United States kill more people annually than cocaine. In one news item I found on YouTube from Bolivian television a military unit went to destroy the coca plants belonging to a small holder. One of them on his pack backpack had a bottle of coca-cola, a product that once used coca as an ingredient and which today kills indescribably more people through creating sugar dependency than does cocaine.